Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So we're very happy today in the GTP seminar to have Christophe Dorn from uh, Oxford University. Uh, although he's gonna explain some more about his affiliation, uh, who is going to tell us about manifold diagrams, a brief report. Christophe, please. Yes, thank you very much, Hisham. Um, the subtitle of my uh, talk is as recounted by a former mathematician, which Hisham already pointed out. Um, this is uh, just to say that um, since several months, I've not been actively uh, thinking about uh, these, these topics anymore. Of course, um, uh, they're still, still very close to my heart and, and I'm happy that I get to speak about them uh, uh, today. And what I'm gonna try to do is to give you a bit of an overview of the of the of the field and the research that has been done. Maybe let me start by uh, telling telling you what manifold diagrams are. Um, basic idea is very straightforward. So, <clears throat> if you know string diagrams, so string diagrams are hopefully familiar uh, to many in our uh, to, to many uh, people in the audience. Um, String diagrams are just diagrams of dots, lines, and uh, areas that you uh, draw on paper in two-dimensional plane. So they look something like this. And manifold diagrams are the higher dimensional analogs of these. So for instance, you would uh, uh, draw a manifold diagram in three dimension, that would be a manifold three diagram, but you could draw them in arbitrary dimension. And they look something like this. Um, this is a, a specific diagram, for instance, where you can recognize um, the two string diagrams that I've drawn uh, on the site. Um, and uh, in the spirit of categorification, uh, the basic idea here is very straightforward. So um, we just um, take the idea, the classical idea of string diagrams and want to port them into, into higher dimensions. It turns out that, um, so yeah, let me give a, a brief summary that's that's not meant to be a history. So uh, because the idea is so simple, it has definitely been uh, long known. So I've talked to uh, Andre Joyal at some point, and he said that already while writing his uh, paper on the geometry of tensor calculus, he was definitely aware that there are these uh, higher dimensional generalizations of, of string diagrams, but he wasn't um, really sure which technology to use to formalize them. And then in the 1990s, there were formalization attempts, um, some high powered formalization attempts via stratified Morse theory uh, to at least uh, formalize manifold diagrams in dimension three. Um, but yeah, so, so that, that ran into technical difficulties. Uh, later on uh, in the 2010s, uh, manifold diagrams in dimension three were formalized in, in various ways. But actually what I wanna convey in this talk is that they're uh, extremely basic mathematical objects. So the mathematics to formalize them is really elementary. Um, Let's ask the question, why should we study manifold diagrams um, at all to begin with? So why is it interesting to try to formalize them? And we'll briefly discuss three reasons for why I think it's interesting. Um, first of all, it's, it's the relation with uh, the Tangle hypothesis. So in the Tangle hypothesis, uh, if, you, if you care about and know the Tangle hypothesis, then uh, uh, you might care about the following two pictures having some sort of relation. So on the left-hand side, we uh, have cells um, that record uh, uh, invertibility data of, uh, of some morphism F. And on the right-hand side, we have a tangle. And there's some correspondence between those. And if you care about that, then manifold diagrams are important because they're like the intermediate link between these two pictures. So um, to the left picture, um, you can get to a manifold diagram by dualization. So these two pictures here are dual, geometrically dual, and the right picture um, can be obtained um, from, or, or, or you obtain a manifold diagram from the right picture by refining 
at the critical points. So there are these critical points here where the line turns around. And if you refine uh, the stratification of these critical points, then you also get manifold diagram. So manifold diagrams are important in this context because they are these uh, intermediate structures um, uh, between cellular geometry and uh, uh, tangles and manifolds. And then a second important reason why I think manifold diagrams are interesting um, is, is the study of free higher categorical structures. Um, so there are these basic results, I should have looked up more about the history here, but um, I think at some point it came as a surprise to people that computats, so strict strict computats don't form a pre-sheaf category. Um, so computats are just free strict higher categories. You just uh, glue on cells inductively in each dimension and generate morphisms from there. And there's no um, there's no category that makes uh, no category of shapes um, that makes the category of computats a pre-sheaf category. The obstruction to that is, intuitively speaking, is uh, the Ekman-Hilton um, Ekman move that starts in dimension three. So um, the braid, if you want, um, because of this coherence, things can be not unambiguously defined in dimension three. And this is where computats fail to be a pre-shift category. Now, weak computats do form a pre-shift category, but the way you prove it is using high power theorems. So actually no one has really worked out what the shapes are for uh, uh, for weak computers. Um, I'm aware of, of recent work by Christopher Dean, where he characterizes this um, in uh, in terms of some, some co-limits, but I don't think they're explicitly computed. Um, so it's not so clear uh, what actually a good category of shapes um, is to define to define free higher categories. And manifold diagrams make this very easy. So manifold diagrams, because the braid is uh, just a manifold diagram as uh, anything else, um, you have built-in coherences. So the, the weakness is, is built in. You just attach new manifold strata at, at each dimension and then freely generate your manifold diagrams um, from the uh, strata types that you, that you attach. Um, you can also think about the invertible case here um, uh, that's that's going back from manifold diagrams to uh, to tangles. Um, and uh, uh, one of my favorite examples for a free higher categorical structure here is essentially S2. So S2 uh, as, as a space, so the two sphere has um, the following strata that, that is generated by, it has a stratum, um, uh, uh, the, that's, that's a zero morphism, which is represented by this blue point. And then to that, we attach a, uh, uh, a stratum type uh, in dimension two. So that's represented by this red point and the stratum on the outside here is actually uh, the blue stratum type. And then from there, we get a bunch of higher tangles. And then uh, subject to some conventions, uh, actually not subject to some conventions, subject to you already understanding how manifold diagram work, how manifold diagrams work, uh, you can very visually represent the higher homotopical behavior in uh, S2. So for instance, you have, you have the trivial um, uh, map, so the trivial self map, but you also have, um, sorry, you have the trivial uh, element in Pi 3 S2, but you also have uh, the Hoff map in Pi 3 S2. And these can be very, beautifully and visually distinguished um, uh, in, in the story uh, of free higher categorical structures via manifold diagrams. But this is the invertible case. Today, we're not going to talk about the invertible case uh, uh, whatsoever because uh, there are some open questions there. Um, one of these open questions relates to um, the combinatorial theory of differential structures. And that's the, that's the third reason why I think manifold diagrams are interesting. So um, for a long time, I was completely agnostic to this, but uh, uh, then in, in recent years in, in my postdoc, I became much more sensitized to the issues of, uh, of um, manifold structures, in particular that topological manifolds are not um, uh, 
very compatible with p-phase linear structures or manifolds or differentiable structures. But importantly, there is a case where this goes away. Um, so there is a, uh, uh, there's, there's a case of framed manifolds where these two, where these three uh, uh, structures collapse. And um, you're going to hear the word framed again in this talk at a later point. So framed is really a way uh, of, of uh, imposing directions. Um, in particular, uh, we're going to talk about manifold diagrams as stratification living in framed space. And in that world, uh, somehow, so in the world of manifold diagrams where everything has a direction, it looks like there's a different type of relationship between the combinatorics and the differentiable uh, 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 structures and, and the topological structures. So somehow manifold diagrams can represent differentiable singularities combinatorially. Like something like this is, uh, I mean, Arnold would say it's a, a two singularity, I don't know, X, X to the like like a cubic uh, singularity um, minus something else. I don't know. <clears throat> um, whereas uh, a tangle like this, uh, a singularity, a critical point like this could be described as a quadratic singularity. Um, so there's this there's this correspondence between um, pictures that you can draw in manifold diagrams and differentiable singularities, and because manifold diagrams are intrinsically combinatorial, um, this suggests a deeper link um, between differentiable structures and combinatorial theory. So that's I think a third uh, a third reason, uh, maybe a more vague reason of why manifold diagrams are an interesting place to do geometry and, and uh, uh, study geometry. Let me tell you um, to what extent uh, progress has been made. Um, okay. Can I ask something at this point? Yeah, go for it. What was it also the claim, or is there still the claim that they all, these manifold diagrams also define higher categories in some way, or is it? Yes, um, true. Yeah, that's 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 a claim. I mean, can get ahead of myself a little bit. Um, so yes, uh, it's pretty trivial to uh, think about what a free higher category is once you've defined manifold diagrams, because you just need to define the manifold strata, and then from there your morphisms are the diagrams that you can draw with those strata. Um, so it's it's not hard to come up with a definition of a free higher category. Um, but in a way, it's much harder to apply this definition to existing a higher categorical uh, 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 objects to, to existing uh, theory. So in particular, um, there's, at present, there's no comparison to uh, existing higher categorical structures. And if that's your benchmark for um, uh, this is a model for higher categories, that benchmark has not been achieved. It is it is work in progress. So it is something that um, uh, people are still thinking about. Right, okay, but, but the definition itself, when you say it's easy to define the free box, so you're thinking of a monadic definition, you, you define free construction, underlying construction, and then define the n categories to be the, um, the, the modules of this monad. Is, is that the idea of how the definition would go? Or? Yeah, actually, you you're skipping. Um, you can skip steps. You can skip steps. You don't need. Um, so in classical computats, you need these two steps. You need to um, attach. You need to attach new cells in dimension n plus one, and then you generate freely all the morphisms from these uh, uh, from these cells, and then the morphisms that you generated, um, you can reuse in uh, your n plus two step, they can be the source and target for the morphisms that you uh, attach in n plus two. In, in manifold diagrams, that's uh, not needed if you want. Um, each, uh, I don't think, I don't know whether there's a good way of saying this, but um, each cell, um, 
already has all the information of its so each singularity type already has all the information of its source and target uh, in it. There's there's no step where you need to freely generate something. So a free higher category in manifold diagrams is literally just um, a list a list of cells in each dimension. But it's, it's just you, you don't you don't yeah you don't need to. Um, yeah, you don't need to freely freely generate uh, uh, morphisms. But what is it free on? Is it like what what, what is it funker on? Is it free on graphs and sets? Free on on cell complexes? Can I say like was it just free? <laughs> free on the point. It's it just... um yeah um it's so in a way you can think of it as the specification of a high inductive type in terms of the constructors. If you want, you can call this a free higher category before passing to a model. So that's what I'm doing right here. I'm I'm saying the constructors are the free thing. So that that maybe is confusing, yeah. Is that is that is that a good analogy? So it's very easy to uh, write down list of constructors. Um, of, of your directed uh, higher types, higher inductive types. Um, but then you're right. You still need to um, you still need to pick a model of higher category, and then maybe you have a functor or, or a model um, of of uh, of your list of constructors uh, in, uh, in in that choice of, um, of, of of higher categories, and that would then be the actual free object. Yeah, just that classically, it's already hard to write down um, these list of constructors. So that's 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 what becomes easy in the manifold uh, uh, diagram setting. But yeah, no, that's 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 a good question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let me start with the Tango hypothesis. So there were two parts, the duality between cell geometry and tangle ge and, and manifold diagram geometry. So that has been worked out. Um, uh, that is, that is uh, more or less straight, straightforward. Um, so it's rooted in some insights um, in a book called Frame Combinatorial Topology, uh, co-written with uh, Chris Douglas. Um, and then it's made much more explicit in a recent paper from last year called Manifold Diagrams and Tangles, Manifold Diagrams, Tame Tangles and Singularities. However, the second part of the equation um, uh, requires the understanding of critical points. And um, so it requires us to, in a way, have a, a classification of the types of singularities that, that can appear. Um, from the perspective of manifold diagrams. And um, that is something that I think uh, uh, we're still pretty far from. And this also relates to um, the third axis here of uh, a combinatorial theory of differentiable structures. Um, as for free higher, higher structures, um, it has been it has been put to use, it has been worked out. As I said, it's pretty easy to write down these signatures, to write down these lists of constructors. This is what, for instance, also is used in homotopy.io. Like in homotopy.io, you just define your generators and then you uh, build diagrams with those. You don't really care about what type of higher category you freely generate. You just, uh, um, you just um, uh, yeah, build, build diagrams. You think of your n-dimensional your diagrams are your n-morphisms. And uh, that's that's sufficient information for uh, for for most users. But as Urs um, uh, as as, as uh, Urs asked, um, there's there's at the moment no uh, uh, no comparison with uh, existing models of higher categories, even though that is that has been worked out. Personal digression: um, I mentioned directed high inductive types. I always thought this was a very uh, a very, very interesting uh, topic and that maybe manifold diagrams will play a role here. I, I did try to think about this a little bit 
and it's interesting that um, somehow coming up with the uh, elimination rules for your higher inductive types is obstructed, like is obstructed by the fact that you need to understand coherences. So you need to understand um, you need to understand your braids uh, uh, and your higher dimensional analogs of the braids, um, your higher categorical coherences. You need to classify those in order to have a strongly normalizing uh, uh, system. So in order for canonicity to be preserved. But I, I count that as a digression. I'm happy to talk. Uh, if this sounds interesting to anyone, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about it. And then finally, um, on the side of uh, combinatorial uh, differential structures. Uh, in the uh, FCT book, uh, we've written down a first conjecture about um, how um, differentiable structures interact with, um, with uh, the, the framed topology of manifold diagrams. So this is uh, akin to, uh, this is something like, um, um, a differentiable structure is unique up to a combinatorial equivalence. Um, uh, uh, this is this the flavor roughly of this combinatorialization conjecture. Um, and then there are also preliminary thoughts on um, uh, combinatorial notions of perturbations and stability um, of, of singularities. So which singularities can be perturbed into which other singularities in the manifold diagrams and tangle paper. But I would call these, uh, I would call these more on the preliminary side of things. Okay, so this, this is roughly um, my broad overview of why you would want to study uh, manifold diagrams. Now let's actually have a, a look at them. So uh, today I just want to focus on the basics I just want to uh, define manifold diagrams. Um, and that's, a, uh, um, that's an achievable goal. As I said, the mathematics is, does not need stratified Morse theory. Um, it's, it's pretty elementary. The first thing that I briefly want to recall is um, stratified spaces. Um, might not be familiar to everyone, um, stratified spaces are spaces endowed with the structure of a stratification. And what a stratification does is essentially decomposes a space into strata. So into, into disjoint subspaces that are called strata. And just from the simple, uh, the simple addition of structure, you can redevelop a lot of algebraic topology completely in a setting of stratified spaces. So let's let's briefly see how that how that works in parallel. So the first thing you can do is pass to fundamental categories. Actually, I want to just think about skeletal here so that I can draw things. So for instance, the skeletal uh, fundamental category of um, S two is just a point. Uh, sorry, of S one. It's just a point for the connected component of S one with the z worth of um, of morphisms on that on that point. In contrast, uh, if we have a if we have a certification here, then the fundamental category would be um, would be not a point for each connected component, but it would be a point for each um, for each stratum. So we have two strata. So our fundamental category has two points. And now these strata are in a, in a relation, in a topological relation, um, namely, if we take the closure of the blue stratum, then this closure includes the red point, but the converse is not, not, the, uh, not the case. And in our fundamental category, this is recorded by arrows from the blue stratum to the red stratum. In fact, there are two different paths that you can take to exit the to, to to enter the red stratum from the blue stratum, so these paths are also called entrance strat path strata, uh, entrance paths between strata, um, and this is recorded in our fundamental category by two arrows. Um, so these are, if you want, the fundamental 
uh, infinity uh, groupoids, uh, the fundamental infinity categories of um, of spaces, respectively, of stratified spaces. And then it's also worth going one step further, namely zero truncating this. So in the case of spaces, if you do that, you end up with a set, just a set of connected components. And if you do it in the case of uh, stratifications, you end up with a post set. So what does zero truncation do? Zero truncation identifies everything above dimension zero. So in particular, these two arrows get identified into the same arrow and you end up um, with a post set. And this is uh, um, this is the analogy you should you should think of as a category theorist here. So um, um, if homotopy theory replaces um, sets by spaces, then stratified homotopy theory uh, does the same, but it starts with post sets. So uh, I always found this helpful as an analogy, um, uh, but uh, it. Yeah, it also uh, uh, it also will have a, a real effect on the type of mathematics that we're going to use. Namely, we're going to work a lot with pull sets. Let's let's give uh, let's give one important example, namely cell complexes. Actually, regular cell complexes. So each cell complex is a stratification where each cell is just a stratum. So for instance, this up here is a cell complex. It attaches a one cell to a zero cell. So it's a stratification that we've seen. Regular cell complexes too are uh, cell complexes. But regular cell complexes are actually, sorry, regular cell complexes too are stratifications. But they're actually very specific um, stratifications. Namely, um, there are the stratified, they include into the stratified homotopy zero types. And that precisely means that there's an equivalence between their pi infinity and their pi zero. So it's very analogous to how you would think of homotopy zero types. It's not a, it's not a, uh, it's a, it's a proper inclusion. So there are other stratified homotopy zero types, which are not regular cell complexes, but you should really think of regular cell complexes as like the, um, as the uh, prototypical example of a stratified homotopy zero type. So for instance, something like this would be a stratified homotopy zero type. Um, something like this is not a stratified homotopy zero type because we've seen that the pi infinity is not equivalent to the uh, pi zero here. So that's not a stratified, uh, stratified homotopy zero type. Okay, so that's my very brief recollection of uh, stratified spaces here. Um, I feel like it has gained a lot of traction over the last decades. There's a lot of good, good lit literature developing foundations of stratified spaces now. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to give, give some references later maybe. But the amount of stratified topology we, in, we, we will need is, is extremely minimal. So um, yeah, probably for what is to come, you don't need to consult any of those references. Okay. So I want to I want to first give a brief geometric definition of manifold diagrams, and then I want to give a the combinatorial counterpart. So let's skip ahead to the geometric definition. So we've talked about stratification. That's like our prerequisite number zero. Um, there are three ingredients. There's directions. A manifold diagram. Lives, is a stratification that lives in directed space. So we need to talk about directions of space. We need to talk about conicality. Conicality is a ubiquitous topic in stratified, uh, stratified topology. And then we also want the finiteness condition. We don't want there to be, for instance, infinitely many different strata in our uh, manifold diagram. So it's a pretty, pretty straightforward uh, finiteness condition. And these three things together are the ingredients that uh, that will lead to the definition of manifold diagrams. So again, no stratified Morse, Morse theory. Let's start with uh, directions. Um, first of all, I'm actually not speaking of directed. I'm, I'm speaking of framed. You can think of framed directed. We made this choice because uh, directed is, is very frequently used. So um, 
uh, framed framed a little bit less so. And uh, secondly, uh, there's also an important analogy and in intuition here to the classical notion of framing. But then again, it's it's important to keep in mind that when I say framed, I mean our custom notion of framing. I don't mean uh, framed in a uh, in other senses uh, that that have been defined. Yeah. So let's define um, let's define uh, directed Euclidean space or framed Euclidean space. It's uh, it's an inductive definition, like uh, almost everything uh, in in higher category theory. Uh, you understand one dimension, and when you understand one dimension, you can start arguing, uh, or you can start uh, arguing by induction. Um, and understanding directions in one dimension is extremely easy because um, because the the real line uh, um, has has very obvious notion of direction, um, namely it has uh, 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 two possible directions, uh, two possible orientations, um, and all notions of framing of the real line are more or less the same. Like whether it's orientation or framing for R one, it's all the same. So we can be a bit agnostic what we what we mean here. And then to define uh, uh, framings on higher dimensional Rn's, essentially what we do is we decompose um, Rn as a fiber bundle of R1's over directed, over framed Rn minus one. And we orient, we compatibly orient all of the fibers. So this here um, would be an example um, of how this is done inductively for R2. So first we decompose R1 as a fiber bundle over R0 and we pick a direction and then we decompose R2 as a fiber bundle over R1 and we pick directions. And there are standard choices for these things because there are standard projections of Rn to Rn minus one. You can just forget the last component. So with this standard choice, we would define the standard framing of Rn. And from now on for manifold diagrams, we just work with standard framed Rn. There's also a natural notion of, um, of directed maps, of framed maps. And these are maps which simply just commute with all these uh, fiber bundles. So it's a map of the top space that uh, descends to maps between each of the projections. Um, and if a map has this property, then we call it a, a framed map. This is the first ingredient. So this is the notion of directed space that we work with. Um, let's talk about the second one. Let's talk about conicality. As I said, conicality is something that's well known in, uh, in classical non-directed stratified topology. In effect, it says stratifications look nice locally. Um, and it means that you can find neighborhoods, like, I don't know, you have some big stratification and you find a neighborhood where your stratification looks like a product of some space and a cone of a stratification. So for instance, this stratification here, this is the cone, sorry, this is the cone of a stratification that looks like this. So it's a cone of, it's the open cone of a stratified circle, if you want. Um, and this stratification here, locally around the red stratum, looks like a product of the space. So this is the tangential part, if you want, and this is the normal part of the stratification. And actually, uh, it's very important. So um, this discussed in Larisse, uh Higher Algebra Appendix A, to make the fundamental category story work, so the pi infinities that I've talked about earlier, um, you really need uh, conicality. So conicality is going to be implicitly assumed whenever I say a stratified space anyway, but we are interested in a framed, in a framed, so in a directed version of this. And this is based on the observation that um, if you take uh, two Rns and take their product, if you take Rn times, Rm minus n. 
sorry, actually, so I don't know. Rk times Rn minus K. There's a standard way of identifying this with Rn. So we want to do is we want to consider this as a frame space, this as a standard frame space, and then use the standard uh, uh, the standard identification to identify this with a standard framed uh, Rn, um, which gives a more rigid notion of conicality. So um, it requires that. Um, so on the right hand side, we still have products. And what I just said explains how you can think of this product as having a framing. So this has a framing, this has a frame, this is standard frame, this is standard frame. Take the standard product and consider it as standard framed RN. And this, then this, yeah. Mm -hmm. The version of the Dijayal on street progressivity condition. Um, uh, progressivity conditions. Um, yeah, it implies a version of it. Very well spotted, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> it's a bit more general than that. Like it does a bit more, but in particular, it also specializes to GL's uh, progressivity condition, yeah. Um, okay, so I just explained that in the, in the standard way, you consider the right-hand side here as having a framing. And then instead of having a stratified homeomorphism onto some neighborhood here, so stratified homeomorphism onto, onto, the, onto some inch here, you require this map to be framed. So this map needs to do something like this. It needs to factor through all these projections. But apart from that, the definitions are identical. Um, so it's, it's a very similar idea. You just put framed everywhere. So that defines what it means to be frame conical. And the last Sorry. definition. Could I ask you a question? I, I completely missed, where's the cone? Could you say again? I, does your picture where's, show a cone or? or where's the is, cone? Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what is conical? So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where's the cone? I have, I have very little space here, so I'm just going to massively zoom in. Um, so if I have a stratification like this, then taking the cone of the stratification. Oh, I see, that's the cone. Oh, that's it, I see. Give the stratification. Yeah. I see it, thanks. So in this sense, this is the, yeah, this is a cone. <laughs> and yeah, it's what gives conicality its name. So it's important to know where the cone comes from. <clears throat> okay, let's, let's talk about this, this last condition, finiteness. Um, um, it's, it's a combinatorial condition. Um, So what, what, uh, what we want is that we want that our stratification, I was wrong. So let's, let's ignore all of these lines here. Let's think of this as um, some stratification of R2. Um, what we want is that this stratification can be triangulated, but it can be triangulated by finitely many simplices. And in order to make this work, given that R, Rn is non-compact, um, this is what you should think of. You should think of that we require that there is a triangulation, which essentially lives in some compact subset of Rn. And then beyond that subset, you just linearly extend the triangulation. So this is something that I would maybe call a, a compactly described triangulation of Rn. So like 
all the important information is in this compact subset, and then you just then you extend to infinity. Um, roughly speaking, uh, I think I think uh, this this uh, explanation here is a bit more accurate. By the way, I'm going to link I'm going to link these notes. I've sent these notes at some point to Urs. Uh, actually, I've I've written these notes for Urs because he. Uh, he asked a question when we were discussing on, on the end form, but I'm going to uh, send, send the notes around. Okay, so this is a compactly described um, triangulation. What does it mean to be framed compactly triangulable? It means that you receive a framed map from a uh, compactly described triangulation. So this is a framed map. Again, these were framed maps. And it's a stratified subdivision. So it's, it chops up this it chops up this stratification over here into smaller pieces. That's that's a stratified subdivision. And these are the three pieces. So the conicality, the directedness, the finiteness that that yield the geometric definition of a manifold diagram. A manifold n diagram is a frame conical, frame compactly triangular stratification of R n where framed is, is implicitly assuming that we consider the standard frame structure on, on Rn. So for example, our simple example here of a manifold diagram. Um, first, from now on, uh, I need to fix directions to tell you uh, where my coordinates are so that I can tell you what my standard, standard Rn convention is here. So uh, here my coordinates are going to be that the first component, the primary component of this diagram goes from top to bottom and the second one from left to right. And then you can, for instance, check that on this green stratum, there is a neighborhood which receives a, a, um, a framed embedding. It's a framed, framed embedding um, that decomposes the neighborhood into tangential space and a normal cone. I mean, this, this is a very simple cone now, but um, uh, the, same, the same applies to higher dimensional diagrams. I don't want to spend too much time on uh, examples in, in higher dimensions. I think it's, it's fun to just check these uh, conditions on surface diagrams, um, if you're familiar with them. Um, they're simply enough to, to, to verify. Actually, I don't know what's hidden here, so I'm gonna, gonna see what I've written here. Um, oh yes, there's, uh, there's one main theorem that I wanna mention, namely manifold diagrams, despite our definition being uh, completely uh, topological, admittedly, we, we did use some combinatorial topology here, but there's actually, a, a bijective correspondence. So this is this is a, this is a very um, tight classification here of manifold diagrams up to framed stratified homeomorphism. So up to homeomorphism that is both framed and stratified. Um, manifold diagrams up to framed stratified homeomorphism correspond to a combinatorial structure. So there's a unique combinatorial structure that you can associate to each manifold diagram. This is not entirely obvious from our triangulation story, because usually there, there no, you can't say the space has a unique triangulation or something like this. It's, uh, it's, it's usually highly, uh, highly, highly non-unique. So in this case, there's a unique uh, combinatorial structure. Um, this theorem provides the, the main link between stratified geometry and combinatorics that's, that's underlying the theory of manifold diagrams. One way, one catchy way to phrase it is it's a form of a directed cobordal hypothesis, um, even though uh, that hides the fact that the cobordal hypothesis is much more difficult because you need to deal with singularities and manifolds. Um, and yeah, it in particular underlies this, this, uh, uh, the story about combinatorial differential manifolds that we alluded to earlier. But let's, in the second part, let's look at this uh, combinatorial story. So for this, 
I will have to jump into a different part of the document. Um, trusses. <clears throat> so trusses are um, trusses in general dimension. There's a very concise way of saying what they are. Um, in a way, they are the stratified zero types. So we've talked about stratified zero types. They are the stratified analog of homotopy zero types. They're stratified zero types of um, framed, frame directed Euclidean space. Um, that's not telling you a lot, but it tells you that um, they're post sets, or, or they have some sort of uh, 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 post set post settle nature, uh, because stratified zero types are uh, essentially essentially just post sets. Um, but then there's the issue of of framing here. So really, everything in the sentence has a framed in front of it. They're the framed fundamental categories of framed stratified zero types and framed directed Euclidean space. So it definitely will run some more explanation. Um, the story is inductive, so uh, one also starts with uh, dimension one, and there it's very easy. So uh, one-dimensional directed um, Euclidean space is just the line with the direction. Now let's stratify that. Let's stratify that. What, what happens is, well, you have um, zero strata, so you have points, zero-dimensional strata, and one-dimensional strata, and you have a bunch of them. You can have you can have any number of them, or it could be just an unstratified line. So um, a truss is the fundamental uh, category of that. So it's a poster that looks like this, but it's a framed fundamental category. So, so uh, just to make this clear, each stratum here has a point in the corresponding fundamental category. I kind of messed up colors there, sorry. This goes to this, this goes to this. This goes to this, this goes to this, and so, and so on and so forth. So it's a fundamental category, but it's the frame fundamental category because it also keeps track of the direction of this line. So actually there's also direction on this. Uh, there's, there's, if you want, there's a second order. So a truss really has two orders. It has this order which records the little arrows, the black arrows, and it has another order which records um, the framing. So they're called face order and frame order. And then it also has dimension information which records the cell dimension, but that's less important because it, it only matters in the degenerate case, um, which we're not gonna discuss here, so. And then you um, argue inductively. So um, an N truss is going to be an N minus one truss with a one truss bundle on top of it. And how does the one truss bundle look? Well, um, it's an interesting combinatorial structure. So for instance, this is a one truss bundle. This is a one truss bundle over two suplex. Um, and I'm not gonna go into uh, too much detail here, but if you restrict this bundle only to um, the zero dimensional strata, so only to the red points, then what you would obtain is a discrete off vibration. If you restrict it only to the, um, to the blue strata, what you would obtain is a discrete vibration. So it's like, it's, it's a functional mapping, but in the, in the opposite direction of the arrows in the base. And if you consider this as a, um, as a, as a full bundle by itself, it's a, it's an exponential vibration. So it's a quite, it's a quite intriguing uh, uh, combinatorial structure. And um, there's, there's a lot of cool things to say. So for instance, um, if you look at the title image of the, of the frame combinatorial topology book, um, it has, it has like a, uh, a cool title image, which highlights one of these uh, combinatorial properties of trust bundles over synthesis. Um, um, so it's, 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 it's interesting to study. Um, and the way this arises is not by choice. So we're not really making this up. It really arises by considering 
bundles of stratified zero types, of conical stratified zero types, stratified bundles over um, stratified zero types, one dimension down. So this is really the story that you that you see here is just combinatorial reflection reflection of um, uh, what is what is forced upon us by by the topology of frame directed space in a way. Um, and I already said this, but oh, that's not what I wanted. I already said this, but an entrance is simply um, a chaining of truss bundles. So in a way, this is a two truss here. It's a one truss. So what's what's a one truss? A one truss is a bundle over the point. So that's literally just, just a one truss, just as we've seen before. And then a two truss is another one truss bundle over that base space. Um, and then for n trusses, you would cons you would just continue the story. So this defines n trusses. They're the stratified zero types. And it might be worth at this point to recall um, what we said about stratified zero types. You should think of them as the regular cell complexes. In particular, simplicial complexes are regular cell complexes. So simplicial complexes. Um, for instance, include in simplicial complexes, include in regular cell complexes. Um, in classical combinatorial topology, simplicial complexes are used to triangulate spaces. We are going to use trusses to triangulate our manifold diagrams. <clears throat> This is how it works. This is how it works. Um, here's a manifold diagram. And this manifold diagram can be subdivided into a coarser, uh, sorry, into a finer stratification. And this finer stratification is the geometric realization of a truss. So this, um, this stratification, if you pass to pi zero, you would find this post set. Now pi zero is, uh, or pi infinity um, is functorial. So instead of just applying pi infinity to this, uh, so this is a framed stratified zero type. Um, so instead of just applying pi infinity to um, this frame certified zero type and obtaining this post set actually this post set together with this entire uh, tower of projections because we work in frame space everything projects um, so we don't just get a single post set we get a tower of post sets um, instead of just applying it to this uh, certified zero type we can apply it to this entire subdivision we can apply it to the map of this stratification to this stratification and this yields a map of post sets this yields a map of post sets, which can be recorded as a functor from this post set or as a post set map to pi zero of F. So this is our stratification F. The stratification F has some pi zero. Um, and then applying pi, let's just say pi zero here, applying pi zero to the subdivision yields a um, yields a poset map or a functor from this pi zero, which is the pi zero of this space, to this pi zero, which is the pi zero of the space. And this is what I've recorded by colors here, because these maps these maps simply identify our points in this poset with strata of the stratification. So this is why I've recorded this map with, uh, with corresponding colors to these, these strata. It's a bit confusing that I'm using the same color for multiple disconnected components here, but uh, let's, let's not go into details here. Um, 
it's also helpful to point out that, yes, this example is also stratified zero type. It's less exciting. Let's maybe look at a uh, something that's not at, at a string diagram that's not a stratified zero type. So a string diagram like this would not be a stratified zero type because you can walk in the in the ambient stratum, you can walk around the point stratum in the middle. So that's not a stratified zero type. And in this case, the trust refinement, sorry, the refinement would look different. It would look something like look something like this. And then again, you would have reached a stratified zero type because now you can't walk around. Um, you can't walk around the the point anymore in a circle. <clears throat> okay. So, just as simplicial complex as triangulate spaces, um, trusses the pi zeros of stratified zero types are used to triangulate manifold diagrams. The crucial point is that there's a unique triangulation. So a priori, or there's a, there's a canonical triangulation. A priori, you could write down many different triangulations. I should say cellulations. So these are cell, cell complexes, not, not superficial complexes. A priori, you, can, you could write down something like, like this, and this also subdivides our stratification. But in fact, there's a, um, there's a relation between uh, these two subdivisions. Namely, this subdivision is coarser than any other subdivision. So there's always a coarser subdivision of manifold diagrams. And this looks, uh, this looks trivial in dimension two. Like in dimension two, you're probably uh, thinking, yeah, well, that definitely introduces loads of unnecessary strata that I don't need in order to subdivide um, uh, this stratification here. But in higher dimensions, in, I don't know, dimension seven, it's, it's, it's much less obvious that something like this should hold, but it can be, um, it can be proven. So it can be proven also from a purely combinatorial perspective um, where we say that this truss here normalizes to this truss here. Um, so this is a form of normalization theorem uh, in all dimensions that, um, yeah, uh, uh, trust reduction is strongly normalizing. And these combinatorial representations, these canonical combinatorial representations based on the uh, coarsest subdivisions are what featured in our theorem, what featured in our combinatorialization theorem. Let me say one more thing. Um, one final thing. In fact, you don't need to spell out um, the geometric definition of manifold diagram at all. You can also uh, define manifold diagrams in a purely combinatorial style, uh, which is which is interesting too. Um, so essentially, a combinatorial manifold diagram is a truss, is an end truss. A combinatorial manifold diagram is an end truss. Um, with a stratification on it, so with, with a coloring, if you want. So uh, a structure like this that colors the, uh, the points um, in, uh, in the post set, in the top post set. Um, and then this has to satisfy some conditions, which actually look very similar, some combinatorial conditions, which look very similar to, um, to a, a, a conicality conditions. So essentially, you're saying that locally, for each element in our truss, um, if you look at the uh, downward closure of that element, then this sub post set, so the downward closure reduces, so it normalizes to something that looks like a product of two trusses. And I haven't talked about products of trusses, but it's uh, it doesn't take a lot of space to define them. So this has practical implications, uh, this fact that you have the parallel combinatorial story to the geometric story. Um, you have, um, you can show via this combinatorialization that links are well-defined. You can develop this dual cellular theory 
um, because of the combinatorics. And um, yeah, it's, it's also uh, a, a key part in showing that manifold strata in uh, manifold diagrams, even though we have not, have not mentioned differentiable structures at all, but they all have uh, canonical uh, smooth, smooth structure. Um, overall, uh, uh, I mean, this was just a very, uh, a very, very short overview um, of, of the definition. Um, there's, there's much more to the theory. Um, I feel like it's very, um, it's very enjoyable to uh, think about the combinatorial theory. It often has the flavor that if you do things that are natural, then things just work out. And if you slightly deviate from the given path, then things just don't work out at all. So uh, I always thought there was, uh, there was, I mean, it, it, it happens in many different areas of mathematics, but uh, uh, it was um, always something that I very much liked about uh, the combinatorics of manifold diagrams, yeah. But much remains to be discovered. Um, and I've mentioned some of these topics before. Um, yeah, but I'm uh, excited that I got to talk about them today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, any further questions for Crystal? Yeah, so <clears throat> if you were to uh, do an calculus using your theory, would this give any insights to the nature of the uh, gray tensor product? Um, I think you could. I think that goes a bit in the direction of um, Amar's work, um, especially the work in his thesis. Um, where he, I mean, he based it on um, the cellular picture and essentially taking, taking products of cell complexes. Um, but these two approaches also are uh, are related. So um, you could, I haven't thought about it. Just to clarify, this Amar Hansi has a very long name that starts with H and starts with an H. I, I don't think I understood that. Uh, uh, I don't know where the microphone is, but it's it's a bit choppy, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 which Amar is this? Yes, Amar, um, the, the Amar you mentioned, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the one. Hadzi Hadzinovich, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. I must feel bad asking this because we've done so much work here that asking about extensions feels wrong, but uh, uh, do, do you have any idea of how you could uh, maybe change some things here to get uh, sort of n-fold, infinity n-fold categories where you use the full cubicle structure to have all boundaries on all faces? Yeah, at some point we were convinced that um, you get n-fold more or less for free, like a graphical calculus for n-fold categories for free. Like my thesis has a final chapter on n-fold categories. But I'm really not sure whether it works, and I've not thought about it since putting it as Appendix C in my thesis or something like this. So, um, but yeah, it's it's a very valid question because um, yeah, because you have um, uh, essentially you have the generic directions, and then um, when you flip a line on the plane, then at some point it's in a non-generic position where it projects to a point in R1. Um, and um, uh, you can represent the uh, you can represent the horizontal direction in this way, yeah, that you would expect in a twofold category. So um, and that happened that extends to higher dimensions as well. But I haven't thought about it since a long time. Thanks. Any questions? Okay, if not, this time, please stop again for a very nice talk.